Welcome back to No Capes, the show where we talk about creator-owned comics with creators who own comics. So this weekend just gone, I had the pleasure and privilege of getting media passes for Oz Comic Con here in Brisbane. I just went the one day for COVID safe reasons. I did a panel in the afternoon with Wayne Nichols. So that was really cool. We got to talk about Uzumaki by Junji Ito. And I picked up some cool merch, some stickers, some pins, talked to a lot of really cool people, got some photos of booths in the artist alley, which you'll be able to see soon. And I picked up a really cool book on color theory by Wayne's brother, Adam Nichols. Uh, if there's a link for that, it will be in the description below for you. And I uh, got to take my mobile recording rig out for the first time to varying results. I had some battery issues and had to switch gear a little bit here and there. So be warned that the lighting and the sound changes a little bit in the videos to come. But please enjoy the next four interviews and the uh, live on stage for the first time. No capes at Oz Comic Con Brisbane. See you next time. table for the last month or so but uh I have, haven't gotten emotionally ready to know the next parts yet. Yeah that's, that's fair enough. Yeah. Okay. What's your all-time favorite non-superhero? Non-superhero? Oh that is a good one. Um I kind of want to say Sandman because that's just my all-time favorite comic and it's not really superheroes it's yeah, like yeah, more it. it's got superheroes in it sometimes but yeah. What's your favorite thing about it? that it doesn't focus on might makes right like and I think that's come across a lot in the Netflix series because um, the dino is way worse in the comics like worse mm. inverted commas it's much more gory it goes for way longer um, it was it was really hard for me to read and I think in the 80s when that came out the idea that then the hero comes in and doesn't punish this person because he's not justice he's green like um, that would have been a much harder sell that you know we're not reading revenge fans He's here. Um, that would have been a harder sell back then, but they don't really have to go that far in a Netflix series in 2022. So um, I think that was really well handled. Like it was a great adaptation because it knew when to follow the source material and when to divert. That's what I really liked about it. Yeah, cool. Okay. And what genre would your absolute dream project be to create? Oh, I don't know. I'm loving like. Westerns with elements of fantasy to them, right? Like, a lot of the time I'll just read anything that's got that to it. Like, um, you know, American Vampire did that beautifully. The Sixth Gun and stuff like that. I'm just like, yes! East of West? Pardon? Have you read East of West yet? I started on East of West and didn't get very far, but uh, it's it's another one that's just been in the to-read pile for so long. And uh, a lot of them, like, Sixth Gun is such a slow burn as well, but it really hooks you in with the action early yeah. on and establishing the rules so that Drake can break them. Like, yeah, it's beautiful. What non-superhero comic have you been reading or read, if any? Non-superhero? I mean, I read the the, the, this, the new edition of The Mandalorian that came out that by counts. Marvel. Yeah. Okay. It's always... Uh, it's always fun when you get to be in one. It is. That's that's the most recent thing of yours that I watched that I really enjoyed was was the Mando. Yeah. Of course, the thing I, I first saw you in was Clone Wars. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Love yeah. Clone Wars. Yeah. Okay. And what was your favorite thing about that book? The. The Mandalorian. Aside from the fact that I, I just was curious yep. what their interpretation yep. of my character was and my physical appearance. And um, what did you like about it? Do they do I mean, it's job? just cool. It's just cool. You feel like it's like. Uh, yeah, you're cemented in some kind of history, right? You know? Yeah, exactly. It, that's really cool. I can only imagine what it would be like to see, like, you've seen yourself on the screen, and yeah. now you're seeing yourself on the page. Yeah. Ex yeah, that's... And, like, they, I mean, these aren't comic books, but I'll tell you what's really cool is, like, I have a six-year-old son who I'm really... Because I never was into comic books too much, but I'm, I'm pushing him to... Yeah. Because I think the storytelling uh, is kind of brilliant and... 
I don't know. He he loves he loves comics right now. Yeah, that, that's great. Okay, and on that note, then yeah. since you're already doing that, what's your fa what is your favorite thing about comics? Just like the art form in general. I, I mean, I do I do enjoy the actual art of comic books. Um, I love the storytelling. I love like. How in a sense, like, because you know, when we're in film and TV, we have, uh, uh, what are they called? Uh, for each for each scene, we have like these like photos. Yeah, what is the storyboards? Storyboards, yeah. yeah. And that's like derives from comic books, right? Yeah. yeah. So I just appreciate the the format of the storytelling. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, and barring anything you're already working on and can't talk about, yeah. If you could play any character from a non-superhero comic, what would it be? I'm a non-superhero comic. Doesn't even matter if you haven't read it, if you know of it, and you think it's cool. Anything, I mean, like, I don't know it specifically, but anything that Neil Gaiman writes. Yeah, good. That's, that's I, good I mean, I love his, his stories, and I love his characters, and his imagination. So, yeah. I mean, maybe, I don't know which comic I would say, but, like, along that, that genre. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, what sort of genres do you like? Genres. Um, I've really gotten to sci-fi recently, but like, if it's not, I like gritty, gritty like real life dramas. Yeah, cool. Okay. I know it's it's very different than. No, no, that, you know. That's good. Fantasy and whatnot. The non superhero genre yeah. has a lot of that. Yeah. Like the, the, the industry has a lot of that sort of stuff. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Yuri. That's, that's yeah, of course. all my questions. Yeah, yeah, cheers. Okay, so the first question I've got for you is what non superhero comic have you read in the recent past, if any? I am into comics, but in the recent past, I'm not really dying. Yep, uh, the one that I've ended up reading is <laughs> in 20, 20, 20, no, 2013, yep. was the Guardian of the Galaxy. Oh, yeah. And the reason behind that was that I was nearly going to be on yeah, in it. That would have been really cool. Yeah, but, but for unfortunate reasons, I couldn't be on the That's okay, that makes sense. That would have been really cool, though. So, um, what is your all-time favorite comic book that, that you've read? Oh, yeah, it's been a long, long time ago. But yeah, especially the Superman thing. Yeah. That was a long time ago. I don't know, ages ago. But, you know, some of those old 90s superhero 90s and all Superman that, yeah. ones were yeah. really good. And the DC, yeah, exactly. Okay, and what did you most like about the Superman yeah. Superman books? Yeah, we're back. Do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The was born in Kenya. Now I used to read the Superman comic when I was young. And then coming to New London. And getting into the industry. And my third movie happened to be a Superman. And I ended up being Christopher Reeves flying, stunned, double, to make him look in the distance. And the way we did it was uh, there would be a green screen, I call it not green, a uh, silver screen. I would be on wires and the camera was for back and front projected cameras. So it, they would go out and make a plate of Neo or whatever they want. They would put the plate, that would be captured through the camera, and I would be captured by the lens. That's really go cool. flying around the sound, sound stage. That's and that's really how cool. we ended up doing that. That's so cool. I love that. Oh, amazing. Um, okay, so second to last question is, what do you like most about the medium of comics? Medium of the comics? Right <laughs> It's an ent entertainment, but the message that I, I can get from it, and it's only my opinion, that yeah, we could, we could, we could learn something from that. That violence that we see in that, is it worth it or not? Yeah. yeah, that's great. That's a really cool takeaway. Thank you. Okay, so the last one is, barring anything that you can't talk about because you're already working on it, of course, if if you could play any character from a non-superhero comic or superhero comic, which one would it be? 
very difficult for skin to answer. Uh, like I said, it would be hard to say anything. Yep. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while, yeah. yeah. That's alright, there's so many amazing projects that you've already been in. I, look, honestly, anything that you chose to do, I would watch. I'd watch the hell out of it. Thank you, thank you. Awesome. Well, that is all my questions, Kira, so thank you very much. My pleasure, yep. So, what's the favourite non-superhero comic you've ever read? My favorite non-superhero comic I've ever read was, um, it was like a dual comic when I was a kid. I was very much into my football and it was called Roy the Rovers. And it was kind of like this, like, he was like, this is the best player on the team. He was unplayable and um, it was Hotshot Hamish, who was like this big, huge Scottish guy. Like, he was like a unbelievably huge human being, but played football. And so when he used to take a shot, and when he got angry, he'd take the shot that was so hard, the goalkeepers would go into the net because he was just so powerful. And then he had a really intelligent small friend, I can't remember his name, but he wore glasses and they were strapped at the back. I remember, this is crazy that I remember this. This is like so long ago. I was like, they don't even do it anymore. They must have stopped doing that when I was like, 13, 14, I would have been in Hong Kong. Yeah, so 13 was the last time that, that, that comic actually came out. But like, he was the intelligent player, but I used to get that every week, week in, week out. I was so excited to, to, to see the new episode and to see the new team that they were playing and, and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, my mum had to go to the store. So we'd go, we'd go to the store, we'd get my comic, I'd get my 10p mixture when sweets were 10 pence. Uh, now they're like 10 pounds for a, for a little bag of sweets. And then, uh, yeah, I had to get the bread, the milk, the eggs, my magazine, my, my, my comic, and, uh, and my Tempe mixture, and I just sit there with the new episode, eating my sweets. Life was perfect, happy place. Yeah. And what was your favorite thing about that comic? Wow, my favorite thing about that comic. I just, I was obsessed with football, with, with soccer, so. The fact that it was a, it was just a cool comic about I don't think there were any more out there. Yeah. I don't really remember any comics, and because the the Hamish character was so like unbelievably big, he was almost superhero like. You know, he was like a technically he was like a Thor character. He had like long hair, like massive casts that were just out of proportion. Like he was just just like this Arnold Schwarzenegger type like player that could. Physically, not actually probably play football. He was too big. It didn't make any sense. Um, but it was just so cool to me as a kid growing up, like loving football, to see this like impossible player and what he could do. And so, as a kid, you use that as inspiration, thinking I'm gonna be like him on the field. And so I'd go out and play, and I'd call myself Hamish, and I'd run around the field with a Scottish accent. I used to think I was like, my name's Hamish. I'm gonna score a goal. That was a terrible yeah, Scottish accent, course. but hey, it's just between uh, us. Yeah, we first watched. Okay. And what is your favorite thing you about the medium yeah. of comics? On the opposite end of you. Like, what do you favorite like thing about the medium? As an art form? My favorite thing about the medium of comics when is... his line was like this, right? No comic is the same, no artist is the same, like... My favorite thing about the medium of comics, as I literally look around this room, is just how... Versatile, how, how different everything is. No comics are the same. You've got all genres here, like all kind of different kind of interests. But like, I grew up in Hong Kong, so I loved all like the Dragon Ball Z. I loved all the kind of um, oh, Spirited Away, things like this. Like, they were just really beautifully drawn, and they weren't lifelike. They were like they had this scraggy hair, like, and I never even like I never even understood it because it was all in Cantonese. But the pictures were so graphic and so beautifully drawn. Like the characters had all these like epic, crazy muscles, and I used to draw them myself. I used to... <laughs> so I don't know. I'd have, been, I'd have been 12 years old, and I used to I used to sell my pictures. I used to draw my favorite characters from anime um, as a kid because I just used to think it was so cool and detailed, and I used to draw ducktails and stuff like that. And I used to sell my comics to my schoolmates for like five dollars here and there. And it actually bought me a Sega Mega Drive <laughs> when I was 13 because I like made I drawn so many pictures that I made so much money I could I could afford a computer. Um, that's what I mean. It's just like 
anyone can do it. Like I had a beautiful fan come up here today and he showed me his versions and he showed me two comics. So he did one and then a couple of years later he showed me his, the, the second comic that he was making. And the progression in his artistry was so good. You can see him kind of fine tuning it. And so anyone can kind of do it, but it's appreciated by all, you know? And, and it's just like a great escape. I absolutely love like, the intricacy of, of color, of like the pictures that can keep you invested. Because nowadays we, we live in the movie world and, and the TV world where everything's very quick. You know, social media, everything's 140 characters. And to keep someone invested in a story with pictures, with the written hand and board or a computer or whatever it may be, it's a real art form. So, you know, I don't think comics will ever go away. Awesome. And the final question is, any barring any that you can't talk about because you're already working on them and you're not allowed to, if you could play any character from a non-superhero comic ideally, but a superhero comic if you want, which character would it be? Who's your dream character to play? I'm gonna say Hamish. I mean, yeah, but now, but now that's a crazy story because if you're saying like, who could I be? Hamish and Roy the Rovers was an epic comic, and I'd love to have been those. But like, you've given me the like the spectrum of the comic world, like anything. So there's so many I'd be like. There's so many kind of like supernatural stuff and like. Neil, Neil Gaiman does like some great stuff, you know, like American Gods really opened my eyes to all kind of that world. Um, there's actually a, a TV series that I'm developing which is uh, an Austrian comic that I can't really talk about but watch out for that in the future because that would be pretty epic. It's along the similar lines of American Gods. Um, I mean, if it's, I mean it's, it's not superhero but it's still kind of like it, it would be Goku, Dragon Ball Z, like, it, it was that, of all the comics in all the world, like, it, was, it just hit me at the, at the right time as a kid. I couldn't understand it, but I just loved the way that they drew. When I, when, as, as a kid in Hong Kong, they had such a huge kind of animation, comic, kind of, environment like, and, and as a kid growing up on that you know Street Fighter was just coming out on, on uh, the Mega Drive things like that so I was really into all that so to see like Dragon Ball Z like I, I still I still read those now so you know they're, they're pretty cool the Scion Warriors ah Super Scion sick I'm getting excited <laughs> um, so yeah I think I was, was, he was the original one that I, that I read about um, it's nice to know that it's all translated now, so I actually know what he's talking about, which is, uh, is kind of cool. Which adds yeah. To <laughs> yeah, awesome. Thank you, Ricky. That's perfect. All right, hello, everyone, and welcome to No Cakes, the show where we talk about creator owned comics with creators who own comics. I'm Sean Sunday. I am the host of, create of the show and creator of comics such as The High Cost of Living and The Mark Van Moves. And my guest with me today is Wayne Mickle. Hey Sean, excellent to be here and uh, good to see you, you guys here at the podcast. And we're yeah, looking forward to talking about Uzumaki today. Yeah, so it's, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a bit of a different one today. Um, we're doing a half hour show instead of an hour, which is like our normal episodes. And we're talking about Uzumaki, which is one of the classics of horror manga, which is uh, honestly not something I usually cover on the show, but when Wayne suggested it, I thought, yeah, let's do it. This is this is going to be a really interesting book to talk about. Uh, Junji Ito obviously is quintessential with the genre of horror manga, and his work is really, really interesting and surreal. So uh, I'm going to let you introduce the book. You get <laughs> okay, so Uzumaki is... It's kind of a weird one. It's set inside this one small town, which I am struggling to remember the name of the town right oh, now. Because, have you got it? Yeah. So, uh, Rutsu Cho. Uh, yeah, Kuru I'm probably going to butcher this, but uh, Kuruzu Cho. In all of the stories happen within this small town, and it's kind of an anthology book. Uh, 
So let's let's see what we can do here. So uh, it, it has got that thing with the art where they do some of the pages being inset in color, and all of the stories follow uh, Shuichi and Kiri are present in every story. Uh, you're two of the residents of Kuruzuko, and it's sort of their thing of going around trying to live a life but feeling like this town is cursed by the spiral and talking about all of the things that happened and experiencing the horrors that happened as a result of this curse. Yeah, it's interesting uh, how it introduces you to the story. So, um, most of the artwork in the book is in black and white, which is great because uh, the artist does such an amazing job of black and white, but it's interesting where it almost takes you from regular reality and the first page being in colour straight into the bizarre world of yeah, this, this yeah. coastal seaside town and especially in Japan and goes into the black and white world. It's like stepping into another reality. Exactly, and it's especially interesting like that because the colours are so bright and pleasant. So yeah, like they're very, yeah, they're very vibrant. But so the story of being about the spirals is interesting as well because you, you see those bright colours and the spirals are introduced straight away in the background. Yeah. In the the um, the grass that she's walking through, there's a field as she walks in into the from the outskirts of the town. She seems to be walking in, and you can see little spiral patterns already emerging. And then it, and it's all in colour at first. And I know. So I didn't actually get a chance to read through the whole book. I'm only about a third way through, but I did notice. Um, I think it's about halfway through. It goes into color again. So I yeah. don't know exactly it's, what um, that is in the story. It's sort of at the start of each new chapter. There's a page or two of color. Yeah, because it's you know there's like chapter one. The uh, what? Oh, I can't remember what the chapter. What's the first chapter called again? First chapter. Good thing I brought the book. Yeah, because yeah, I, I knew. Three I mean, is the scar. yeah. I don't. I don't speak any Japanese. I don't know if you do. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's handy having this here. Um, chapter one is the spiral obsession, part one. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's part one and part two, and then the scar is the third one. The scar's the third one. Yeah. Yeah, and so each new chapter, not every chapter gets a full color page, but it does get a splash title. Yeah. But as they start each new volume, I think that's where the color page is coming. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. yeah. Um, and obviously, like, Junji Ito's art is phenomenal. It's it's so intricate and detailed. Um, it's, I find it a lot different to a lot of the manga that's out there as well. Yeah, like the, yeah. The way he draws the faces and people. Sure, yeah. I haven't actually read a whole lot of uh, manga myself. Um, I, when I was just, you know, getting into comics, probably back in the early 2000s, I mean, I... I was really into it in the 90s, and then I was uh, getting into a few things like uh, Three by Three Eyes um, and Gunsmith Cats. So Dark Horse were doing um, some translations of the books at that, at that time. And uh, I read a few of those, but since then I haven't uh, read any at all. So it was really interesting to pick this up and to yeah, see what a distinctive style that um, yeah. Don't Do Ito has in this book. Yeah, and... Look, honestly, I I found the book not that scary. Oh, okay. I really enjoyed it, and I found it very surreal yep. and very creepy in places. And a lot of the art, obviously, was very disturbing. It's very well drawn. Uh, it's it's horrifying in places. I, I think it's uh, it, there's a particular challenge to trying to to scare your audience when all you've got is words and pictures on a page. I mean, this say in film or television, there's so much that's, um, in terms of making a horror, there's so much that you can bring with sound. So it's all conveyed through sound effects. And, and I actually do a pretty phenomenal job. And considering it's translated as well, yeah. so it's up to the quality of the translation, which is seems to be Yeah, the, the sound well. effects are really good. Um, it, it, it really does evoke the vibes of those creepy sounds like in the grudge and the ring that the, the spirits create yeah. um, but you're right it is a challenge to to create an, an actual scary book 
Uh, the one thing I have liked about a lot of horror comics, though, is books that are really good at using the art as a jump scare using the turn page. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's one of the key things. You, yeah. You, you, you plan it so you can get to that last panel and then you turn the page for the big reveal. And yeah, I think that's one of the, the key things that uh, he taps into with this book for the, the scares that you're talking about. Yeah. And like straight away we're introduced to the, the surrealness and the creepiness of, of things that are going on with uh, Kiri coming across Shuichi's dad just staring at something growing out of the wall. Yeah, well, I, what I like about this page here is it's the first sign of something being... Active. Like, through the narration, she describes um, the town, and this is the first sign of something's being off, and you see, you, you know from reading the description of the book that it's about the spirals and, the, and people in the town, the top town being haunted by spirals and its possession by spirals. You come across um, her friend's father in this alleyway, and he's just there, and he looks like he's frozen. Yeah. And he's just staring at what looks like a snail shell. And he, he, what's so interesting is the expression on his face. She sort of she asks him a question and he doesn't respond to her. And it's like, is he frozen? Like, what, yeah. is, what is happening here? And he's literally transfixed by the snail, yeah. which you find out later. But it's just such a it's one of those weird, creepy moments. The way that he doesn't respond to her and he's just got this slight sort of smile on his face and he's just staring at this, this small spot in a darkened alley. It's just yeah. so weird. Yeah, exactly. And then it. later she goes to his house and discovers that he has a whole collection of spirals and he yeah. brings him to her place and here he's meeting her dad. And this is an, an indication of one of my favorite things about Junji Ito's artwork though, is actually um, how he draws like mania in characters. Yeah, through through the eyes. Yeah, like yeah. He just the the way he does the the face and the mania and yep. really the, the, the feral energy yep. of these characters that are being affected by whatever it is yep. is probably my favorite thing about his work. That was, it's a really nice touch in that third panel where he's drawing the shape of the spiral and the way yeah. he's actually like drawn this spiral shape so you can. You can see it's like it's drawing it in the air. That's, I, I saw that and I thought that's a really nice way to represent yeah, there's, there's a lot yeah, of really what's going on in his mind. Yeah, it's like his, his spirals are just more than real to him. Exactly. There's a lot of really clever things that uh, Junji Ito does with his art. Yeah. Uh, even, in, even that last panel, it, it, as it moves on, one of the strange things that the father does is that he realizes that you don't need because he's so obsessed with the spirals and the, sh the spiral shape everywhere. He's like, you don't, it's not just the spirals are like outside of you. You can yeah. let the spiral inside of yourself. Yeah. And in that other, in that last panel, it seems like it's starting to be suggested in, in his eye. The way he did the rendering around the eye is almost starting to begin to go in a spiral pattern. Exactly, right cool. exactly. And yeah, like you can see here, is the this sheer amount of detail that you know puts into a page. Like, this is just the, the single page splash showing how obsessed Shuichi's father is with the spirals. Yeah. And there's just, like, I can't imagine the time it took yeah. to do this page. Yeah, I was looking at that page this morning thinking, man, that is really impressive, the amount of work that he's put into that. It's, it's, it, and it really, um, it captures that feel of this guy's obsessed, absolutely obsessed, where every object in his house is uh, is filling up the spirals at this point. Exactly, and and like another thing, just another shout out to Junji Ito is that it's not easy to draw a spiral that's pleasant to look at. It's easy to yeah. draw a spiral, but to draw a spiral that you actually enjoy looking at yeah. is really annoying as an artist yeah. myself. Yeah, yeah, no, I get what you're saying. It's, his, his style is very down to work, but there's something about it that is just there's a there's a unique quality. There's something about his, like his artistic vision that comes through, and he makes everything, even the most mundane things, look interesting. You know? Yeah, and that's it. Like this, the, the big thing is that like even the scariest, well, except for one story, which was pretty messed up. Um, even the scariest things that happen in these stories are all just like surreal, spooky takes on very mundane things where they shouldn't be yeah yeah everyday life events yeah. you know just coming over the, uh 
to meet the parents of your friend one evening and in what should be a totally normal situation it just becomes completely bizarre and nightmarish. Exactly. <laughs> Especially on this page, which was where the body horror started coming in, with what you were saying about him doing the spirals with his eyes. Yeah. The depiction of this here is so interesting. The way it's got all these, the, the mania and the vines. Yeah. The, 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 and they're all moving in spirals. And uh, that, that actually would have been quite challenging. I mean, I'm just thinking about how I might have approached those analysis. But to show it, because it then moves on. I don't know if you've got a shot of the next page. I'm but not then, sure the next next Yeah, it was interesting, the next page, because you start to, oh, then he goes into his time. That's where it gets really nasty. But because the page after that, like, you start to see the eyes moving independently. Then the page after that, there's a shot where you see both the eyes sort of, and he's drawn all these motion lines and they're spinning, yeah. and you really get the sense that they're inside his head going, woo, 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 woo. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Would, he's like, got freak out the people who see him. Yeah, exactly. He's got a real gift for depicting like the energy of what's happening on the page. Yeah, yeah. And he, even on um, even on the other characters that are observing like, the insanity that's going on with him, like spinning his eyes. He put all these like motion lines and these kind of like lines, like wiggly lines, and mm. it's, it really captures the, the fear emotion that they're feeling. Exactly. Yeah. And you can really feel all that emotion and the beats of the story in the art. But the, the one thing I would really love uh, would be for whoever did the translation to also do like a localization. Mm -hmm. Because for me, I think a little bit of why it wasn't as scary for me was in the translation, a one-to-one -one translation from language to language doesn't always carry the same emotional impact in weight mm -hmm. because sometimes it's very kind of stiff and sure. robotic. Yeah. And I feel like in a few places, the translation really lets that energy down. Sure, sure. So I feel like a localization would be really good. Uh, and I don't mean a localization in a lot of Aussie slang either. But just in a more like modernized, local to where the story sure, is being sure. released and distributed, yeah. just have a bit more of how that place talks yeah. now. Yeah. So it felt, it felt a bit, uh, the language is a bit neutral. Yeah, it felt a bit detached. Yeah, yeah I, no, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I wasn't, see, when I read it, I thought, is this, and I, it, it might be helpful to like talk to someone who speaks fluent Japanese to get their take on it because I felt like that was perhaps an intentional because the story is like quite out there to have the characters speaking in very plain terms and I mean the, the, the dialogue is quite good yeah but it's yeah there's no uh there's no like colloquialisms of, yeah like, to the location and, and yeah, I just felt it like, seems very straight exactly yeah. I felt in a few places like it was a bit stiff and I feel like that was the translation and maybe being if I could read it in the original Japanese it might, it I would be more like immersed yeah. in the story yeah. uh, it's a very good story yeah. but I just I feel like yeah that there's a, a little something lost in that translation sure, that sure. I couldn't be as fully immersed in it as I wanted to be yeah I get what you said um, but yeah, like you said like the dialogue is really good and the story is well paced and well written um, I just I felt a little bit detached while reading it yeah. because of that. And I guess that's probably why I haven't read a lot of manga because... That's what I was going to ask you. Have you have you read other manga and experiences? I've read some sort of and, and it's kind of similar. Yeah. Um, even like the, even the Dragon Ball Z manga yep. has some really stiff dialogue because of the translation. Yeah, yeah. And, I, yeah, but sort of. This, I guess it's inevitable. It is, and yeah. this is why in the gaming Comes industry, to a translator. exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's why the, the the tabletop gaming industry localization is something that the industry really pushes for. Mm -hmm. Not just translation, but localization, so that the concepts and the ideas that are trying to be put across in the game that you're playing as you're reading the book mm. actually translate properly. Because how you might explain something in Brazil say yeah. is not how you would explain it here. Yeah. And it doesn't have the same feeling. Sure, sure. Yeah. I guess that comes down to um, the publisher and, and yeah. where they're releasing the book and um, yeah, I, I it's biz so I assume they're like UK or US based and uh, yeah, I guess it's something that um, it's probably like budget 
monetary reasons where they don't do that. You know? Yeah, it probably is. Yeah. But this this double page spread I really liked after the cremation of uh, Shuichi's dad. Yeah. And the ashes formed the spiral. The and then, continues. <laughs> yeah, and then turned into that tornado that went down into the lake. Yeah. And so uh, we should explain what happens to the father, should we, or, or is that well, no, how, how yeah. spoilery do we? Do uh, well, we uh, are we concerned yeah, about about that or not? Hands up if you're worried about spoilers. Is anyone worried about spoilers? No. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So, so, so uh, after the early page where the father realizes that he doesn't need external spirals, he can create them in his own body, spiraling his eyes and spiraling his tongue, and then he orders this tub that gets delivered when no one else is home one day and then later the uh, the female character, I'm totally blanking on her Kiri. name Kiri, yeah, she, she comes to deliver a, a pot that um, yeah, that uh, her friend's father had her father. Yeah, oh, her father had yeah. created for her friend's father yep. and so she, she brings it over one day and um, Oh, no, I think I might be getting the story a little bit. Stuck, no, you're actually. right. She does. She goes to bring the pot over, and he says, "Oh, I don't need those things anymore." That's where he yeah. confronts her with the eyeballs. Yeah, that's when the eyeballs and the tongue and then, happen. But, the, but then you see, you see that he gets that tub delivered. Yeah, the mum comes. And, comes and then the mum and the son find the like the, the father's not there. They find the father, and he's put himself inside the tub, and he's twisted his body around, like yeah, literally he, into he a spiral crushes inside the, the tub. Bones in his body. Himself. So that he can roll himself yeah. up like yeah. a roll of hubba bubba. And he's, just, and he's twist, and inside really, this wooden tub. It's really cool in the page as well because like his whole body is just weirdly twisted around. But then he's still got his tongue out and like yeah, and then like, that spiral down again. in there as well. It's yeah, it's so it's very disturbing. It yeah. did make me laugh a little, but it was very disturbing to flip the page and yeah. I and, I found myself laughing, and you know, like I said, I haven't read the whole thing, but I did find myself. I got a bit of dark sense of humor, but I found. I think it's intentional, a little bit that's, of dark humor. That's the thing, that's the thing I want to, I need to read some more Junji Ito and maybe watch a couple of interviews with him because there are certain things in his stories that I'm like, this has to be intentionally funny. Yeah. Not just a mistranslation or anything. This has to be... It really it really evokes a range of emotions. And it does. Uh, and that's that reaction when you, something's so creepy that you don't know, it, it scares you, but you got to laugh at it as well. Yeah, well, that's it. Well, that so it. Like, I was, like, looking at the page like this, <laughs> but I was cracking up yep. because of how silly it was at the same time. I it just was, I just thought about the uh, Judge Ito drawing that picture, and I'm like, that must have been... He was probably laughing when he's drawing it. Did like, you get I, up this is so snail? crazy. This the snail. Oh, uh, you know what? I think I'm just before that. Okay, yeah. I'm not going to talk about that one then because I don't want to ruin that for you. But when you get up to the snail, mm -hmm. those are the panels that I had to think about Junji drawing those yeah. and how long it took him to draw them because he was laughing his ass off at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. it just gets really... They, they get progressively darker but also progressively weirder as the book continues. Yeah. yeah. And I, I got up to about four, page 460 of 620-ish. So I'm almost done. Mm -hmm. It's it's a big book. If you're considering about reading it, maybe just grab volume one. Because if you get the all in one, it's it's six hundred and twenty odd pages. And so it's a big read. Yeah. So if you're not sure it's if a, you're into yeah, manga horror yet, maybe grab volume one first and then pick up volume two and three. Yeah. Um, I did see this on the shelf over at King's Comics while I was browsing before. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the here, this scene here is after Shuichi's dad has been cremated and out of the chimney of the crematorium, his ashes form this spiral and start swirling around and like his face bulges out of the smoke and then the smoke all rushes into the waters of the lake, Lake Dragonfly, or Dragonfly Lake it was called. Yep. And, and the, this is where the mother starts to really yeah, get affected yeah, by it as I, well. I skipped, she sees the face of her husband in the, in the, the drip, billowing yeah. ashes. Yeah, the second one is really disturbing. I skipped that because it was a bit gory and I didn't want to disturb anyone too much. But the mom start, it has a phobia of spirals after seeing the husband all bent out of shape in that tub and is put into a, a, a mental facility to help her recover. And like his spirit is haunting her and teasing her about the fact that there are spirals in your eardrums 
and uh, or on your fingertips and on your it's fingertips spirals like everywhere on the body so and she she's so scissors. she's so paranoid at yeah, that point yeah yeah there's that great panel with the scissors and the fingertips and, yeah uh, and then we move on from that to the scar which is probably my favorite of the story so i was hoping that we'd get here in, in a half hour five minutes cool okay so this one was really interesting you know there's this she was a new transfer, if I remember right. Yeah, yeah, um, new at the school. And the most beautiful girl in the school, everyone falls in love with her, and they're convinced she's got magic powers yeah, and Yeah, so there's something about this girl where yeah. all the boys fall in love with her. Yeah, and then she met Shuichi, and he could sense her scar and freaked out, and she became obsessed with him. And because of that connection to Shuichi, the scar starts to turn into a spiral instead of a crescent. Yeah, he's he's particularly sensitive to this town and, and the, the effects of the spiral. Yeah, yeah. and it, and it's it, it's uh, explained in the beginning of the book, from what I remember, that uh, he goes to school out of town. Yeah, he went he, to the school that she. Yeah, and now from. he now he goes to a different school. So when he leaves the town, he's not affected. Like the, the effects of the spiral yeah. aren't don't exist outside the town. So he then comes back into the town. And he can feel how bizarre and crazy this place exactly. gets with the spirals. Exactly. And yeah, and, and this scar continues to transform and continues to grow and change her body until eventually she and a potential suitor are completely consumed by the spiral. This yeah, this panel is was particularly <laughs> horrific. Where the yeah, but just actually, the, and the panel before, just when the scar's growing and the, the hair reveals it, and it's just this giant like burrowing into a yeah. hair circle. It's, it's, it's so it's so unnerving. And then when she gets to this point, when she actually devours the the suitor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's very very disturbing. And, and then after after that, she herself she she goes inside the spiral as yeah, well. Yeah, she she consumes the, the spiral of... consumes her whole body. Yeah, oh dang, I don't have that page, but yeah, that one she's completely consumed by the spiral. And I can't but she just she's just gone. Just, she's just, just, just inside the yeah. spiral and gone. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, I just can't help again as an artist to think of how painstaking those panels were to draw for yeah, Junji. Absolutely, yeah. Like I mean I I guess He's mapped out the whole story, and it's just like levels of, yeah. of insanity with the spirals and planning, you know, the steps and how it gets crazier and crazier. And it does. It continues to get weirder. Um, Kiri's dad becomes obsessed with the spiral. He's making these clay pots that, when he puts them in the kiln, are normal, but they start to warp and deform, and the spiral pattern forms in them once they've been fired. And it turns out that he's using clay made from the ashes that fell into the pond and settled into the dirt inside the pond and he's scooping yeah. that out. So the, so the clay is essentially haunted by the yeah. spiral. And then, yeah, this happens with the, the faces popping out and like... So he's, he's made a pot and he's put it in the kiln and it's come out with a spiral. Yeah, and, the, and, and the father got the face of which spirit the yeah. ashes are in that clay. Right, yeah. <clears throat> and then eventually Kiri comes in, despite his warnings not to come in when he's working, and sees all the spirits screaming in the kiln. And then the kiln explodes. Yeah, it gets it gets really cool. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It gets it gets really bizarre. This one was interesting actually. This one was this was probably my favorite story in terms of the silliness of it. This was the one with the two young lovers from right, different right. families that hated each other. Yes. And then... So a, a bit of a R Romeo and Juliet yeah, type yeah, story. Yeah, sort of a, a Romeo and Juliet that turn into a sea monster. <laughs> <laughs> they, they run away from Quite their the family twist. and take her refuge in an abandoned building and they see these two snakes intertwining. And uh, when the family finally chase them down to the beach and are confronting them, they twist themselves and snap their spines and stretch their bodies until this starts to happen and they intertwine like the snakes and then leap into the ocean with the feet acting like the flippers of yeah. the snake sort of sea snake at the end and inspired by the, the twisting of yeah, the snakes and disappear forever we never know whether they actually died or if 
they further turned into some kind of a creature because of the spiral curse or what? Mm. It's interesting in, in the depiction of the when the, the bodies get spiraled because it, it really stretches the, the bounds of reality because the way it's depicted there, they're so long and elongated. Mm. But that's not physically possible no. for a body to do. But in the, the, the reality of that world, it, it really works. Yeah, with the, yeah it's, you know, it's, and again, is sort of evoking that energy of the classic folk horror yeah. and like you know Japanese and Korean horror movies where the monsters do look like people but they're people that ain't right yeah yeah I don't know if uh, if any of uh, this stuff's been uh, adapted into there's an anime. animated series coming of this oh really that would be fantastic yeah. Check that's the, the first thing that's been adapted is Uzumaki is oh, okay. excellent so that that'll be really interesting I think it's going to be like an anthology series yeah maybe I'm going to guess probably three short episodes per story or something okay. I don't know is this uh, is this mostly I mean his most um, popular it's work probably that he's one done? of his most well known ones yeah um, it, definitely uh, there are a lot of other really good ones as well, but this is probably the one I've heard of the most. I had, I had heard of it um, through a, a work colleague and friend, and um, then I was in a, I think it was a QBD bookstore, and I heard some of the, the staff there talking about the, the manga that they had and um, how popular they were. Yeah. And I saw the book, and I remembered having to talk to a, a friend about it, and uh, I was like, you know, I'm going to buy this, I'm going to check it out. Is it, this yeah. just looks so cool and interesting. It's exactly. a great cover as well. Yeah, one of, one of my friends introduced me to it, and they've got a tattoo on their leg of the girl with the spiral. Oh, right, and so yeah. we've reached the end of our half an hour. Okay. So where can people find you? So I, I'm lo- online, uh, Wayne Nichols underscore artist on Instagram, or Wayne Nichols art on Facebook. That's pretty much my thing. Or, or wnichols.com and uh, is my And also website. at a booth down there where the comic book creators are today. Yeah, yeah in the Artist Alley, yeah, yep. GA3. You can come and see me there. Excellent. And you can find No Capes on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at No Capes Show. And you can find me at Brain Beast Studios on all socials. Um, we've got three seasons of the show where I sit down with a different comic book creator every week. We pick a book that we've both read, read and loved and gush about why we love it for an hour. I've had people like Derek Robertson, who's the co-creator of The Boys on the show. Uh, Cullen Bunn is due to come on the show next season. Uh, Kieran Gillen is in the lineup and a bunch of other really, really cool people. And so season three has got four episodes left, including Ryan Lindsay, another Australian creator. And you can find that on YouTube, Spotify, and all good podcast places. Uh, but if you want a business card to go and find those socials yourself later, just come and find me. I will be around on the floor after the show. Thanks for sitting down and watching, and thanks for being here. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. <laughs>